Hey friends, welcome back to my channel. And if it's your first time here, I'm Janetta, an author who loves to draw. On my channel, I focus on combining storytelling with art. If that's something you're interested in, please like, comment, subscribe, and share. Let's get to it. Chapter 15. It took everything within Dante to not go sit outside Brooklyn's apartment building to make sure the only thing Hunter did was drop her off. Glancing at the clock, he thought she would have called or texted him by now, but she hadn't. He hoped that she was just so tired from partying that she crashed and burned. Dante decided his efforts to wrap up this case and find a new career would work more in his favor as far as getting Brooklyn back in his life for the long haul. He jotted notes on a pad, things like who was Megan talking to on the call Ryan overheard. He still hadn't figured out the connection to the goon and his case. Besides the obvious fact that he's keeping an eye on Ryan's associates. As another hour passed, Dante sat his notes on the side, pulling out his phone. He texted Brooklyn that he'd be by her place by 1 p.m. to get her for brunch. She texted back okay. He decided to work another hour and call it a night. Wondering what Hunter and Brooklyn were doing made it impossible to stay focused on work. Dante texted Brooklyn the next morning that he was on the way. He didn't get a reply back, but that wasn't unusual. As he parked the car, he wondered if she would be in her I party all night jogging suit or full makeup and sexy throw on dress to hide the fact that she had partied too much. After seeing her in that red dress, he was wishing for the latter. A resident was coming out when he was getting ready to ring the bell so he just went in. He knocked on her door several times and waited. There was no response. He pulled out his phone and called her cell phone, but no one answered. He wished he hadn't erased her home number out of his phone. Hey, Brooklyn, are you in there? He knocked louder, wondering if something had happened. Brooklyn the Hunter popped up, hearts racing at the pounding on the door. Brooklyn looked at Hunter. What time is it? He picked up his phone. I don't know. My phone's dead. Hunter looked at the alarm clock on the nightstand and cursed. I'm going to be late. Brooklyn scooted across the bed trying to fix her halter. Only me, she exclaimed as she adjusted her dress. Dante, hold on. I'm coming. Brooklyn, I'm running late for an appointment. But I hate to put you in an awkward position. I really have to get going. Hunter looked apologetic. But Brooklyn also saw a little mischief in his eyes. That's fine. Just grab your stuff while I let Dante in. Brooklyn turned quickly and made her way to the front door. Dante knew something was up the minute she opened the door. She was still in the red dress. Her hair and outfit were both disheveled. You did remember our date. Of course. Come in. She grabbed him by the hand and pulled him in. He walked in and came face to face with an equally disheveled hunter. There was an awkward moment of silence until Hunter spoke. Well, I need to get going. See you later, BK. He gave her a quick peck on the lips, then patted Dante on the shoulder as a greeting and a taunt on his way out of the door. I'll call you later, he added as he walked away. Brooklyn closed the door and looked as she was daring Dante to say something. It's not like you explained who that beauty was that occupied your bed the other night. She smiled at him. It could be worse. I could have returned your threesome offer. She told him and nearly choked with laughter at the look on his face. I'm just kidding. Come on, have a seat. I need a few minutes to shower and get dressed. Dante muttered under his breath. What the hell? When he heard the shower running, he decided to do a quick peek into Brooklyn's bedroom. He knew immediately she hadn't slept in her bed. He looked the couch over on his way to the guest room, but it didn't show any telltale signs of a wild romp. In the guest bedroom... He noticed the tossed aside blanket and the fact that the bed covers weren't pulled back. He decided that both Hunter and Brooklyn had slept in the bed. The fact that the bed covers weren't too askew led him to believe that all they had done was sleep. He knew from experiences that they would have been in disarray if Brooklyn had had sex on them. He smiled to himself as he made his way back to the living room. Thirty minutes later, Brooklyn appeared in her party all night jogging suit. Damn. Dante thought to himself, what? You don't like what I'm wearing? 
Brooklyn question, looking at the disappointment on his face. No, you look nice. But for the next day, we're definitely going somewhere that warrants you wearing a dress like you had on earlier. Dante stood. Are you ready? I am, Brooklyn replied, grabbing her purse. Just as Dante helped Brooklyn into his car, his cell phone started ringing. He pulled it out. It was Lang. He held up his finger to let Brooklyn know that he needed a minute to take the call. She nodded, leaned her head back on the headrest, and closed her eyes. Dante stepped away from the car so that Brooklyn couldn't overhear the conversation. Hey, Lang, what you got? Dante asked. It struck me that our guy was shot and killed, and Ryan was shot and laid up in the hospital for days, but not one cop came to investigate. When I called the hospital to see if anyone had reported it to the police, they claimed there was no record of our guy or Ryan being admitted. I tracked down and called the staff that was on duty that night. Each one claimed that no gunshot victims were admitted while they were on duty. And let me tell you, I could feel the fear resonating off of them. Now George's body is missing, and all records of him being there have vanished into the wind. We have to figure this out soon, Dante. The scope of this is getting wider and wider. Whoever's behind this has to be powerful. Dante cursed under his breath. How had he let that slip past him? No cop showing up at the hospital should have been an immediate red flag. Where was his head? He turned towards the car, looked at the sleep in Brooklyn, and immediately knew his answer. Should he pull back from her until he figured this out? Would pulling back open the door wider for Hunter to come sweeping in? I think we need to regroup. I'm going to have to wrap things up with Brooklyn quickly. I'll call you when I'm done. All right. In the meantime, I'm keeping an eye on Tuck. My gut tells me that he's a key player here. Just be careful, Dante told Lang before hanging up. Lang sat in a coffee shop across the street from Tuck's office. She thought about the events that had happened up until now. It was apparent that Tuck, who at the very least heard the shots fired at Ryan, didn't feel frightened for his life. He had returned to work the next day and hadn't been scared into running or hiding. Had he been the one who had set the ambush up? It seemed likely. Her earlier search of the office hadn't turned up anything that would blow the case. Drumming her fingers on the coffee table, it occurred to her that sitting outside waiting for Tuck to do something unusual wasn't the best use of her time. He had shown himself to be a creature of habit. Maybe it was time to go search his place. Unless he finally broke his routine, she had at least two to three hours before he left work. She knew his home address from her earlier search of the office. She was about to stand up to leave when the receptionist exited the building, holding a package with the business logo. Why was Tuck sending the receptionist out to deliver a package? Lane watched as a woman climbed into her car and pulled off. Tuck was now alone in the office. Five minutes later, the goon from the picture Dante had taken pulled up in front of the Tuck's building and got out of his car. What the hell is going on? Lang whispered under her breath. And she watched as the goon entered the building. She quickly wrote down the goon's license plate number. Lang sent a quick text to Dante. Goon has arrived at Tuck's office. 20 minutes went by and Lang became nervous. Was Tuck in trouble? As soon as she stood and grabbed her bag, the goon rushed out. He swiftly made his way to his car, got in and drove off. Something was definitely up. Lang was about to exit the coffee shop to rush across the street when everything around her shook and the window of Tuck's office blew out. The force of it almost knocked Lang down. People came rushing out of nearby businesses. Tuck's office was engulfed in flames. Brooklyn was tired, but not so tired that she missed the fact that Dante was preoccupied. When the first text came in, his preoccupation became something more. Brooklyn, I hate to do this, but I just got a lead on a case that I have to follow up on immediately. Do you mind if we wrap things up early? I promise I'll make it up to you. Uh, sure. I'm tired anyway. Dante quickly waved their waiter over and handed him a large bill. This should cover the check plus tip, right? The waiter gave a pleased look and Dante grabbed Brooklyn's hand. Come on, I have to drop you off quickly. They were 15 minutes away from her place 
when a second text came in. Dante read it and cursed. He made a sudden U-turn in the middle of the street, style in Brooklyn. I'm sorry, something major's come up. I need to drop you at the bus stop. The hell you will. You'll have to take me with you and drop me off later. But Brooklyn, I don't want you in any danger. Then don't drop me off at a damn bus stop, she demanded with a serious attitude. Though it was against Dante's better judgment, Brooklyn would just have to come with him. He picked up his cell phone and called Lane. Are you sure you're okay? He didn't bother with hello. I'm fine. I'm definitely doing a whole lot better than Tuck. Lang stood behind the police tape with the crowd, watching as the firefighters battled the flames. She had parked a few blocks down and had walked to the coffee shop. She hadn't wanted to draw attention to herself by rushing back to her car. So as people spilled out of the building, she mingled with them. The firemen had arrived on the scene first, then the cops. It was the arrival of the cops that delayed her departure. Dante, you aren't going to bleed this. The goon is back on the scene. He's a cop. One thing Ryan had to learn rapidly was to follow his instincts when they claimed he was in danger. He immediately sensed it when an unexpected knock resounded on the door of the apartment Dante's men had him holed up in. He wasn't the only one who sensed trouble. Just a minute, Jason, the larger of his two bodyguards, called. He gestured to his partner, Paul, to take Ryan and go. Not needing any prompting, Paul took Ryan by the arm and made for the back bedroom. Taking the escape route that they had already mapped out, they climbed out on the fire escape, but instead of going down, they went up to the roof. As they reached the roof, they heard the sound of gunfire coming from the apartment. They picked up their pace and crossed over to the next building via a large board they had placed there days ago for such a moment as this. The bodyguard pulled the board across once they reached the other building. Come on, Paul whispered. They moved under the cover of night. Still carrying the board, he led Ryan to the other side of the building and strategically placed it so that the chimney would block any followers' view of them as they crossed over to the next building. When they made it to the adjacent roof, he pulled the board across so that it no longer connected the two buildings, then left it laying on the roof. Crouching, they made their way to the purposefully broken roof door on the abandoned building they were now on. Once inside, they moved quickly down the three flights of stairs. Ryan crouched down by his protector when he positioned himself under a window in the kitchen at the back of the first floor apartment. From there, they had a clear view of the alley. No one was there. He signaled for Ryan to follow his lead. Ryan stood and a sharp pain from his wound shot through his body. He bit his lip to keep from crying out. Ignoring the pain as they ran quickly out the back of the building, Paul pulled a black tarp off a motorcycle hidden behind a gate covered with overgrown weeds. Get on, he told Ryan as he climbed on. Ryan was on in an instant and had just taken home when the bike shot out into the night. He held on for dear life, fully expecting bullets to fly by or even slam into his back. It was 10 minutes into the ride before he finally let himself feel some relief. The relief was short-lived. They pulled into a abandoned lot. Paul climbed off the bike, then pulled Ryan off and threw him to the ground. He pulled out his gun and pointed at Ryan. Taking a step towards the scrambling Ryan, he demanded, who the hell did you contact? What do you mean? I didn't contact anybody. Sharp pain shot through Ryan's wound again as he tried to reverse crowd walk out of the way of the gun. You're a damn liar, and if you don't start talking soon, I'm going to blow your lying head off. My partner is most likely dead because you couldn't lay low without calling somebody. Now who the hell did you call? He aimed the gun at Ryan's head. All right, don't shoot. I lifted your partner's cell phone earlier and tried to call Megan. I had to find out how she was mixed up in this. I couldn't believe she had played me. And what did she say? She didn't answer, so I slipped the phone back when your partner wasn't looking. I didn't think they could find me from that. Now you know, Paul cursed under his breath and lowered the gun. He looked at his watch and cursed again. Come on, we have to get out of here. They were walking back to the back when Paul's phone rang. He looked at it and answered fast. You got out? He listened. 
Ryan looked down as Paul grunted, and he seemed to repeat Jason's answer. Barely. Meet us at the pivot, Paul told Jason, giving him the code name of their meeting location. And do me a favor, get rid of your cell phone. It's been compromised. He gave Ryan a searing look before hanging up and climbing on the motorcycle. Get on, he commanded gruffly. Ryan did so without hesitating. Chapter 16. Lang decided it was time to make her exit. The cops would scour the crowd for suspects, and she didn't want to be seen. She walked closely behind a group of patrons from the coffee shop, returning to their cars after viewing the exciting events. When they broke off from the larger crowd to head back to work, Lang pretended to walk with them. When she reached her car, she climbed in and tried to start it. It wouldn't start. This day just gets better and better, she barked as she hit the steering wheel. She called Dante and provided him instructions on where to meet her. He pulled up within 20 minutes. Though she was surprised to see Brooklyn in the passenger seat, she didn't show it. She climbed into the back seat and instructed, Let's get out of here. I have to get my car later. Are you okay? Dante asked as he pulled off. Lang noticed he was trying to ignore the deadly look Brooklyn was shooting his way. It was apparent she remembered Lang from the other night. Like I said, I'm fine. Good. Uh, Brooklyn, this is Lang, my partner. Lang, Brooklyn. Hey, they both stated, neither happy to see the other. But Lang suspected it was for two entirely different reasons. What's going on with all the fire trucks and cops? Brooklyn asked with a frown. Are we going to drop her off so we can talk? Lang asked, not trying to be rude, but anxious to talk to Dante. No, Brooklyn challenged. Maybe you should be the one we drop off. After all, you interrupted us. Dante, we don't have time for the jealous girl bull, Lang snapped. We need to work fast to figure this out before someone else gets killed. At the mention of someone getting killed, Brooklyn changed directions. What the hell is going on? Who got killed and why? Brooklyn, it's a case Lang and I were working on. I don't want to drag you into it. Look, Lang is right. I need to drop you off and spend some serious time figuring this thing out. I know I'm in a race with Hunter, so I'm going to ask you to hold off with him a minute while I work through this case. That's a lot of damn nerve. I'm supposed to sit around while you and Ling Ling go chasing around for who knows how long. She may be your partner, but she was also comfortable enough to climb into your bed. We really don't have time for this. Lang was worried that they would let precious time slip away by trying to coddle Brooklyn and explain things to her. Look, I did that because I was trying to get rid of you that night. Dante and I had never crossed that line. This case that we're working on is serious and people have died. Well, I would love to leave you with a warm, fuzzy feeling about you and Dante's relationship. I can't. We have a widow who can't bury her husband because his body is missing. We have a rogue cop who's apparently killing people, a missing girl who is either in over her head or playing a supporting role in all of this, and a client who most likely has ulterior motives. So if you can get over yourself for a minute, we just need a little time to sort this out. Then you and Dante are free to skip down Lover's Lane for all I care. Dante had parked in front of Brooklyn's place during Lane's tirade. He caught Brooklyn and pulled her out of the car just as she was about to go over the seat and tear into Lane. Let go of me, Dante. I'm tired and I don't need any of this. She pulled away from him and turned back to the car, pointing at Lang in the back seat. You're lucky he stopped me because I would have torn that smart-ass tongue right out of your mouth. Lang chuckled. Go solve your case, Dante, and leave me alone. My life has finally settled to a sweet spot, and I don't you and all your P.I. drama to go messing it up. The sound of the bedroom door bursting open started sleeping Megan awake. We have to go, her partner Aaron told her, grabbing her arm and pulling her out of the house. She had never seen him frightened, and the fact alone had her terrified. Megan trotted behind him. What's going on? I'm not sure. Tuck's dead. I would have been too if I hadn't got caught by that damn train, he stayed ahead into the car. What happened? Megan asked as she fastened her seatbelt. The office blew up. I don't understand what's going on. Tuck just wanted me to get you away from Ryan and safely to your husband now that he's back in the States. He drove quickly away from the area. Where are we going, Megan questioned as she dug around in her purse, pulled her gun out, and sat it on her lap 
under her purse. Somewhere safe. Tuck set up this house arrangement. He continued to look in his rear view mirror. If they came after him, they might know where we are. I don't want to stick around to find out. Megan continued digging her purse until she found her phone and sent a text. Did Tuck tell you where to find my husband? No, that's why I was supposed to be meeting him, so he could tell me where to take you. He was continuously looking in the mirrors. Megan slid her gun back into the recesses of her purse. Look, I don't know what's going on with Tuck, but that's nothing to do with me. How about we get a room in one of the hotels up the road? Megan, I don't know. Tuck told me I needed to keep you safe until I took you to your husband. His hands were shaking. He rolled down his window to let in fresh air. Aaron, you did. You got me away from Ryan without any confrontation, and you've been making sure he doesn't show up. Megan touched his arm. That was all Tuck wanted. Whatever else Tuck has gotten himself mixed up in has nothing to do with this. I hope you're right, he responded. Look, well, get some sleep. I'll contact my husband's aunt. He normally always go to her house to retrieve his things once he gets back into the States. Megan smiled as Aaron visibly relaxed. It would be no problem dropping you off at his aunt's place. That was probably the address that Tuck was going to give me before the accident occurred. He spoke, sounding like he was trying to reassure himself. She pulled into a motel up the road. Hey, why don't you see if they have two rooms for the night? He pulled into the parking lot and Megan handed him some money. As soon as he exited the car, she pulled out her vibrating cell. Did you take him out? The man on the other end asked without saying hello. There is no need. Tuck told him nothing. Megan kept a watch on the motel door. Are you sure? He questioned. Positive. What happened to Ryan? Megan's purse fell from her lap and onto the floor. I'm taking care of it, but you need to take care of your watcher. We can't afford for anyone to find out our plan before we're ready to reveal ourselves. His voice seethed with anger. You're right. We can't have him going back speaking to anyone that could help him piece things together. Megan reached down to retrieve the contents of her purse. I'll take care of him in the morning. You take care of Ryan, and I'll meet you at the spot. Aaron paid for the room, got the keys, and headed back to the car. His movement suddenly halted near the car, and he stood there, momentarily frozen, in place and listened through the open driver's side window before slowly walking back to the front end of the car. When he tapped on the hood, Megan's head popped up and he heard her mutter, we're good to go. He waved the key at her, then motioned for her to come on. We lucked out. They had two rooms, but one is upstairs and one is downstairs. Aren't you going to grab your stuff and lock up? Megan shouted out the window. He walked up to the window. Yeah, yeah. He laughed awkwardly. Then opened the door and rolled up the window. Let's get the bags and I'll take you to your husband's house in the morning. She picked up her purse as he grabbed the backpack he tossed on the back seat in his haste to get out the house. That sounds like a plan. Megan took hold of her bag, smiling as she followed him to the hotel, muttering, He won't even see me coming. Gus, the goon, sat in front of Alec McNear, the man who was holding his life hostage. It was odd for him not to be the one striking fear into a person's heart, but the guy pulling his strings had no heart to strike fear into. Alec just sat there behind his computer, saying nothing for a while. The goon wasn't going to enjoy it, telling him this. Gus, did you retrieve the file from Tuck? Alec stared intensely at him. No, Gus inhaled deeply. Well, I guess that explains the fireworks. He leaned back in the chair, smiling wickedly. At least the file was destroyed. Maybe not. Gus braced himself for the reaction. Alec quickly sat for it. What? As I was leaving the office after arming the bomb, Tuck snickered and stated that the files weren't there. We wouldn't know where they were until they innocently popped up. Gus studied Alec as he stared, lost in thought, saying nothing for a long time. There was no way Gus would have time to disarm the bomb or untie Tuck. He wasn't a bomb expert. He was just following instruction. If Tuck didn't give up the file, he and the office were to go up and smoke. The file has to be in the acquisition paperwork. Alex stood, walking over to the bookshelves and staring at the photos. 
we can't have Brooklyn coming across it, especially with her relationship with Dante. That would be a huge problem. What do you want me to do? Gus stood, thinking this thing wasn't going to end well for him. If it was only his life on the line, he would throw in the towel because at the end of the day, he would be the only one paying the cost for his mistake. Hit Brooklyn's office tonight and retrieve the file. It has to be there. He turned away from the pictures. Gus grabbed his jacket off the chair. How will I know it's the right file? If you find a picture of me in it, then it's the file that I'm looking for. Alec returned to his chair as Gus exited the room. Hope you enjoyed today's story. If you did, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share. Until next time, be and stay blessed.